Good morning, delegates. Uh, first of all, let me introduce my university. WSU is uh, Walter Sisulu University. And some of you may not know who is Walter Sisulu. He is the founding father of the modern South Africa. In other words, he spearheaded the revolution. And he hails from Umtata. That's why we named the university after him. And he was also the mentor and a close associate of Madiba. You know who's Madiba? Yeah, everybody knows. And Madiba's hometown is about 30 kilometers from our university. And while he was the president, he used to come to the university library on his own, without any security, whenever he finds time. So that is how he interacted with people. And Madiba's personal interest, or the university is his brainchild. So we are very proud to see our logo here, and thank you, organizers, for that recognition. Thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, looking at the three names there, I am in the middle. That means I do nothing. <laughs> uh, the first one he is the author of this article, my postgraduate students. He did a master's, and he has got his degree now, and he is employed in the same department. The one, the third one, Dr. Avatedu, she's my PhD student. She also got a degree, and she is now a senior lecturer in the same department. So we work as a team. That is that, uh, the, the authors of this article. Look at the faculty. The faculty focuses on three major issues. It's not just the HIV. Of course, we know that prevalence of HIV in Eastern Cape in South Africa is very high. The second disease that is very prevalent in Eastern Cape, that is the province, is esophageal cancer is one of the highest in the world. So we do a lot of research. That is my other team. So we work in uh, three different teams. This team looks at HIV AIDS related issues. The second one looks at the esophageal cancer. And you know, what is it due to? It's mainly due to the maize. And the fermented maize. And you see the, in the Eastern Cape household, they stored the maize for a whole period of year in a, in a container where there is chance for the bacteria and other things, toxins to, to sort of contaminate. And when they use the maize, we have found a link between the consumption of that maize, not properly stored, can lead to the esophageal cancer. There's a lot of money going into that research, and we have done some publications on that using a different set of team. And the third area of research is probably uh, uh, in the limelight of is what is called PBL, problem-based learning. We do not follow traditional curriculum in the university where we teach our medical students. We follow PBL and WSU is a pioneer in South Africa to have introduced our PBL, and it is one of the five major universities in the world which is recognized by WHO. So all of our doctors are trained through this curriculum. So I'm very proud to, well, um, announce that WSU is recently introduced and recognized as one of the uh, partners in what is called NET. The NET is an association of the PBL uh, curriculum universities in the world. So we are one among them. And now coming to the topic, 
Why did we do this study, the vasoactive agents and the etiology of hypertension and obesity in HIV patients in, in, in Tata? Sorry, I switched it off. So you can take a break. <laughs> you need a break after the introduction, I'm sure. You, you hit the top button, that's what they're doing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the usual layout, introduction, aims, materials, and methods, statistics, ethical consideration, and that one is very important because we are dealing with patients where the informed consent, both orally and in written form, is very important, and our university is very strict, and to get an ethical uh, approval, it took us a long time <laughs> doing the research. Then the results, and so on. And for some of you who may not know what I'm talking about, I just want to give the introduction, saying what is a vasovascular tone. The, the vascular tone is the one that we talk about in the blood vessels. And uh, you know the endothelium there releases uh, some vasoconstrictors and vasodilators. The best known vasoconstrictor, as you can see, is vaso, uh, endothelin one and the best known uh, vasodilator is nitric oxide. So that's the one we are going to talk about. And NO, the nitric oxide, it maintains basal vasodilator tone, and there are three forms, ENOS, ENOS, and INOS, that is in various tissues, these different forms of uh, nitric oxide synthetase. That is the enzyme which synthesizes nitric oxide. And this is where we want to highlight our friend who gave a talk on libido in, in <laughs> remember, why is it that increases? That is the culprit. Your Viagra contains nitric oxide, right? Something to induce uh, the erection, okay? So the three forms of endothelin are ET1, ET2, and ET3. And endothelin, this is the one that is found in the vascular uh, endothelium, is, releases ET1. And then the ET1 increases interleukins, TNF, and decreases nitric oxide. See, this is the association we are talking about, the endothelin and nitric oxide. Some references say endothelin decreases nitric oxide. One is a vasoconstrictor, the other is a vasodilator. Then we look at uh, the various receptors. This is in, this, in the, at the level of the tissues. We get ETA, ETB2, and ETB1. The one that we are interested in is the one in the endothelial cells, that is ETB1. And again, activation of ETB1 receptors in the endothelium causes vasoconstriction, and that is the main reason that we get endothelial dysfunction, ED. ED also refers to another ED. If you all remember, erectile dysfunction. I'm not talking about ED there. I'm talking about endothelial dysfunction. So, nitric oxide and ED, uh, not ED, EDP1, are counterparts in vascular function, and an imbalance between them lead to endothelial dysfunction. And you see why it's important. Endothelial dysfunction can lead to vascular disease. If a condition arises where ET1 levels increase, then you know that there's something wrong with the endothelium. So an increase in ET1 endothelium indicate damage or injury to endothelial cells. And you know in atherosclerosis, which leads to hypertension, you find elevated levels of ET1. How does it do that? The cellular mechanism is a G protein coupled receptor subtype. And this nitric oxide is a labile free radical with multifaceted action, wide tissue distribution, and, and is found everywhere, ubiquitous. It's synthesized from L arginine through the action of NO synthase or ENOS. This is the one that we are going to uh, concentrate today, ENOS. And whenever there is inactivation of ENOS, 
due to oxidized lipoproteins, there could be a problem with the endothelial function. However, ET1 is quickly removed from the circulation by a receptor-mediated pathway in the lungs. And the last bullet says statins. The statins is the one that we use for decreasing the cholesterol. They have done some studies and they found statins might influence vascular tone by modulating the expression of endothelial vasoactive factors. Sorry, it's too much of introduction, but then because I knew that this is an audience where there are different specialists, I wanted to, to introduce you to the topic properly. Now we are looking at the topic itself. We have various forms of treatment, the PIs, protease inhibitors. They promote endothelial dysfunction indirectly, not directly, indirectly by elevating circulating lipids. That is the action of protease inhibitors. And therefore, the use of protease inhibitors have been shown to have cardiovascular diseases, mainly because of elevated cholesterol, triglycerides, and some structural changes like uh, carotid uh, intima thickness, atherosclerotic lesions, and therefore said to have atherogenic properties. But remember, the benefits of PI should be balanced. In fact, it should be ignored against the long-term, uh, should be balanced against the long-term risk of CV diseases. Then we have another set of the, uh, drugs, NRTIs, that is nucleoside reverse transcription inhibitors. They have direct effects on the vascular endothelium. A is a T, is supposed to have a direct vascular effects. And uh, uh, the, the direct impairment of mitochondrial function, this is not an in vivo study, it is an in vitro study done in rats. So let us ignore it for the time being. That is how it acts, but it's not done in humans, so we won't go in there. But the, the major one is heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy. This has been shown to induce dyslipidemia, insulin resistance, body fat distribution, similar to metabolic syndrome. This is very important because long-term use of heart has actually can induce hypertension. This has been proved by a study, uh, Burgess and et al. And the prevalence of hypertension was higher in patients, but although it was not so uh, statistically significant, but the hypertension is one of the side effects of heart. So we wanted to look at whether these things are really true in our patients, and so uh, this is what I've already explained but if you look at the left panel, this is a very uh, complicated interaction. Maybe it's like a husband and wife, endothelin one and nitric oxide. If you look at the left panel, the ET1, the endothelin actually induces nitric oxide. And what nitric oxide does, like any, any female, it goes and inhibits endothelin. That is the major uh, uh, intricacy in this system. ET1 induces nitric oxide, but nitric oxide inhibits endothelium. She, she has the control over endothelium, but that is good. If you allow the ET to act, if you allow your husband to act, he is going to go haywire. So there is a control. So that's what NMO does. So on the, right, on the right panel, you see is a different scenario altogether. Whenever there is inflammation, as it happens in HIV, there is oxidative stress, there is NOS inhibition, there is no nitric oxide. What happens? Endothelium, endothelium now brings about uncontrolled, unmitigated high vasoconstriction. So we need to have a check, and that is done by nitric oxide. Whereas uh, this uh, interesting study, if you see endothelial cell, they all live, coexist, endothelial cell and smooth muscle cell. 
And as I said, ET1 is the receptor, uh, the ETB is the receptor of the endothelial cell, whereas uh, the ETA is the receptor in the smooth muscle cell. And it acts through the PI3 pathway. ENOS is actually activated by endothelin, and nitric oxide is released from endothelial cells. Nitric oxide goes into the medium and goes to stellate cells, induces smooth muscle cell. Through the guanyl cyclase pathway, it causes relaxation. If you see on the right side, the NO through the guanyl cyclase pathway causes relaxation. On the other hand, endothelin acts directly to cause contraction in the smooth muscle cell. So one is a constrictor, the other is a relaxer, and both are vasoactive and both interact. How do they interact under the influence of various drugs? That's what we wanted to study, and we did this uh, elaborate study. And our objective was to associate between blood pressure, body composition, and endothelium. The second one, blood pressure, body composition, and nitric oxide. And then across the groups and in relations to the BMI, body mass index, we wanted to correlate. Then uh, is a simple descriptive comparative study. A quarter sample was used. Our patients actually come from in and around the Mtata. Mostly we have clinics under our control, that is the hospital and also from NMDA, that is Nelson Mandela Academic Hospital. And this study was conducted in a random manner, planned to convenience population according to inclusion and exclusion criteria. And we targeted 150, in fact, we got more than that. Uh, in fact, 154, 57 HIV positive participants, 40 HIV positive on heart and 57 negative participants controls. The question is, and consent forms were issued, and they were eligible for inclusion in the study if at the time of data collection they were aged 18 to 60 years and signed the consent form. And the exclusion criteria we followed a certain protocol. So we excluded those who are under treatment for hypertension or those who use anti-diabetic agents, growth hormones, steroids, oral contraceptive pills, or any anabolic agent, substance abuse, abuse and appetite suppressors, or pregnant or had breakfast in the past, had a breastfed in the past year, who have or who had an acute infection within three months of the study. So. This is a, 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 a protocol that we had to follow. And we uh, used certain uh, instruments like body composition was measured by using anthropometry and Omron B500 body composition monitor, height by stadiometer and blood pressure by sphygmomanometer. And for the endothelin and nitric oxide assay, we uh, took 20 millimeter, uh, milliliters of venous blood between 8 and 9.30 of, after 10 to 12 hours overnight fast. And remember, we used to give the patients uh, incentives, both to cover their transport as well as for their feeding. So uh, this was, we were very, very um, stringent on that. And the enzyme immunoassay kit was used for the quantitative determination of ET1, dendrothelin, and nitrite colorimetric assay for the determination of nitric oxide. And the statistical package, we used the version 19, multi-way analysis of variance and covariance. Both were done. And also we did uh, <coughs> a lot of correlation study. We used uh, meant, uh, some elaborate statistical package where we had to compare between the BMI and the interrelations between the hypertension and BMI and so forth. And uh, we considered a p-value of uh, less than 0 0.05. Ethical approval was obtained, and that is the number. And we want to thank WSU Research Directorate for funding the study. Well, if you look at the, the number of uh, uh, distribution of the study group, 
as usual, we had females. This means not that they are highly, uh, highly uh, in the risk group, it is because they are willing to take part in the study. So that is where we think that the, the, they are very open you know, to suggestions and they volunteered, in fact, they, nobody pulled out. And if you look at uh, the percentage distribution, again 37 on positive on treatment, 25 not on treatment, 25%, and 37 control, and, uh, which is negative, HIV negative. Uh, too, many, uh, too many things in this uh, table, so I just highlighted the ones that I'm, I'm more interested. You can see there, comparing the males and females, the height, and you can see there's a distinction, and the waist circumference, that's where, that is the one that is uh, really interesting. Waist circumference and hip circumference both are higher in females, pointing to obesity, more incidence of obesity in females. And look at the skeletal muscle fat, SMF, low in females, high in males, but whole fat, very high in females. BMI, very high, and RM is resting metabolism. Resting metabolism, again, is low. All this indicates they are prone to obese, obesity. <laughs> then we looked at the aging. 30 years, 30 to 39, and more than 40. As you expect, the waist circumferences increased from 30 to 40 and so on. All other, other parameters didn't show much of change. And even if you look at your, um, the endothelial levels and all that, it's not much of a change. But the main change that we see there is the diastolic blood pressure. It's uh, advanced in, uh, in people with 40 years and above. The high rise in diastolic blood pressure is not a good indication. A systolic can rise, but not diastolic to that extent. Now, this is the, the main crux of the study. We compared HIV on heart and HIV not on heart. Compared these, there's not much of a difference between those in red or in blue, the middle one. And even the uh, blood pressure changes are not significant. The main thing that changed is the endothelin and nitric oxide First look at the one in the second column, HIV on heart and HIV not on heart. What do we see? We see that it's increased. Both endothelin levels and nitric oxide levels are both increased in HIV patients on treatment. So this is the comparison between underweight, normal, and overweight. And you know we categorized according to this. And again, we find a significant change in their in the values. Do you have time? Uh, yeah, just a few more minutes. Thank you. And uh, this is the comparison and where we in, uh, related between the the BMI as well as your uh, uh, nitric oxide levels. Okay. In general, what we are trying to say here is the females participated voluntarily. High visceral fat is a specific risk, especially because of the blood vessel inflammation. And BMI high in females, bordering on obesity, risk factor, no doubt, for hypertension. And all the uh, parameters that indicated as the age increases, no significant weight changes between HIV uh, on treatment and not on treatment. But in both HIV groups, BMI, remember whether they're on treatment or not, the BMI, whole fat, SMF, resting metabolism, similar to those of HIV negatives. That means all groups are in the risk of pre-exposure to diet 2 diabetes and hypertension. So this BMI is the one that we need to focus. 
and elevated endothelin, luckily elevated endothelin also leads to elevated nitric oxide, therefore compensates for the vasoconstrictor effects. And that is why there is no high prevalence of hypertension in these groups. Because whenever the endothelin level goes up, it also induces nitric oxide, which compensates for that vasoconstrictor effect. So what, but, you see, there are certain, certain uh, limitations to the study, and therefore we are going to use, if you look at the last but one bullet, flow-mediated dilatation is a good surrogate marker of nitric oxide, and that is what we are going to use uh, in our further studies using Spigma core and endopat, which can assess your macrovascular components. And we will also use arterial stiffness by pulse wave velocity and augmentation index. And that is the conclusion. My, our main uh, limitation is uh, a limited number of patients, and we would like to increase in, in our next study. Thank you very much. Thank you.